Hello and welcome to the first edition of War Memorials, an introduction. Over the coming weeks, I will try and record a series of short videos that give a bit of a background into a few of the UK's more famous memorials. In the future, if you've got suggestions for memorials I could cover, please let me know in the comments sections below. Anyway, let's begin. And to begin, I felt that I really had no choice but to start with the Cenotaph the most famous of all memorials, and now in its centenary year. It was designed by Sir Edwin Lutyens, originally to be a temporary showpiece for Britain's post-war victory parade in 1919, but it proved so popular that a permanent one was built for the following year. It stands, for those who don't know, along Whitehall, a famous road in Westminster that connects Trafalgar Square in the north with Parliament Square to the south. It is at the heart of the UK's political centre, indeed, truly the heart of England's political centre since the 11th century. Originally, the Cenotaph was built to commemorate British troops, those who fell in the First World War, but since then it has come to honour those who fell first in the Second World War, and since then those who have fallen in all subsequent conflicts that the UK has taken part in. So in this short video, I want to talk a little bit about the architect, Edwin Lutyens, and about how the Cenotaph came to be, what it is and what it represents, as well as a little bit about its history and the services associated with it. So let's begin with the architect. Edwin Lutyens was particularly famous for adapting traditional styles to suit modern tastes. He designed many English country houses, as well as public buildings too, and was probably the most famous and greatest architect of his day. Indeed, historians have even compared his achievements with those of Christopher Wren, who of course designed St Paul's Cathedral. You can view his London home in Marylebone, which is marked with a blue plaque to commemorate him. Just to give you a very quick idea of his work and style, here are a few of his works which include both large country houses, such as Heathcote in Ilkley, but also churches, schools, and the British Medical Association in London. Lutyens was particularly known for his contributions to Delhi's architecture. Indeed, India's President's House, the Parliament Building, as well as much more were designed by the British architect. In fact, he also had a history of designing war memorials as well, having designed the anglo boer Memorial in Johannesburg in 1910. That memorial honours the men of the Witterwatersrand who joined as British soldiers in the Rand regiments and who had lost their lives during the Second Boer War, which ended in 1902. So fast forwarding now to the Great War, this conflict took the lives of 886,000 British military, many of them very young men. No war before or since has come close to this figure. The tragic loss of life left many in Britain brokenhearted. Almost one million sons, fathers, husbands, brothers would never return from Flanders fields. And early on, a decision was taken to not repatriate the war dead but to bury them near where they fell, in the fields of Flanders and France. In part, this was done to prevent the possibility of richer families paying for their sons' bodies to return home, while poorer compatriots could not. I urge any of you that have not already visited the cemeteries in Belgium to do so. Not only will it touch your heart and connect you with our history, but it's actually only an hour or so drive from Calais. Anyway, the lack of repatriation meant that mourners did not have a grave or a memorial to honour their loved ones. Plans were originally set up by the Imperial War Graves Commission, now the Commonwealth Graves Commission, to create a memorial in Hyde Park, and Lutyens was actually consulted on that, but the idea was eventually scrapped. Nonetheless, the desire for such a memorial was there. Following victory in November 1918, a parade in London was arranged for July the following year. David Lloyd George, the Prime Minister, had seen that the French planned to construct a type of catafalque, a sort of raised tomb to place alongside the Arc de Triomphe along the Champs-Élysées 
for the Paris Victory Parade. In fact, in the picture alongside David Lloyd George, you should be able to see exactly the style of memorial that was used in France. He liked this idea and he set about having one designed for London's parade. Showing his liberal colours, he demanded that the memorial must be non-denominational. Importantly though, it was planned to be temporary and only for this parade. So I just wanted to pause briefly here to go over exactly what a cenotaph is and how Lutyens came to be aware of them and indeed to use one as his, as his memorial. The actual word cenotaph comes from the Greek cenotaphion, which means empty tomb. And these structures, and you can see one in the picture just here, were used by the Greeks in ancient times to commemorate their battle dead where they were unable to retrieve their bodies from the field. And indeed, there are still many in existence in Greece that date from ancient times today. And while Lutyens was working for his friend, the horticulturalist Gertrude Juckel, whose, whose garden and home he designed in Munstered Wood, he was with another friend, Charles Little, and Charles Little named the bench, which you should be able to see in the bottom left hand corner, just in front of the birch tree. He named this bench the Cenotaph of Sigismunda. And that led to Lutyens inquiring, you know, what was a cenotaph? And he eventually learned about the cenotaphs from, from ancient Greece. Sigismunda, just uh, for your information, uh, she is a character from Bocaccio's short story and um, there's a very famous Hogarth picture of her which likely uh, all three of these guys would have been uh, would have been aware of so that's just kind of the story of how the architect came to be aware of cenotaphs as a memorial uh, and indeed of course he would have had that in his mind when designing his famous cenotaph um, a few years after all this happened. We don't know how exactly Lutyens came to be appointed as the architect behind the memorial, but he was well connected in government. He was friends with both Lionel Earl, a senior civil servant in the Office of the Works, and also Sir Alfred Mond, the minister in charge of public works. It's likely that one or both of these connections meant that he was the man chosen for the job. Anyway, when Lutyens is asked to design a memorial, the idea of cenotaph or a cenotaph seems to enter his mind almost immediately. The very same day that he is approached by government to design a memorial, he has dinner with his friend, the writer Lady Sackville, and he shows her a sketch of his design that he'd already completed. Amazingly, this design hardly changed at all in the weeks that would follow. He submitted his design in early July, and by the 7th, it had been approved by the government. It's worthwhile bearing in mind that he'd been thinking of ideas for some time, given the Hyde Park plans that he'd been involved in. And so it's likely that even though he designed this extremely quickly, that he had ideas of a memorial to the war dead for quite some time. The temporary cenotaph was built from wood and was unveiled in a quiet ceremony on the 18th of July, the day before the planned victory parade. Amazingly, the architect himself was not actually invited. The next day, however, the 19th of July, Britain's victory parade took place. 15,000 soldiers and 1,500 officers marched down Whitehall and saluted the cenotaph. American General John Pershing and French Marshal Fernand Foch were amongst them, as well as Field Marshal Haig and Admiral of the Fleet David Beatty. The Cenotaph quickly gained public adoration. Given the fact, of course, that the dead weren't brought home, it came to represent a substitute for a tomb. The public began to lay flowers after the parade, and within a week, 1.2 million visited the Cenotaph. The Times commented that the Cenotaph made a deeper impression than anything else on the parade. Given its popularity, 
quickly a movement developed in support of a permanent senator. Tory MP William Ormsby Gore petitioned the government and soon the majority of the House of Commons supported the idea of a permanent memorial. The Times newspaper and local authorities also wanted a permanent memorial, but they preferred one on Horse Guards Parade or on Parliament Square to avoid the problems of traffic that might happen if one, would, one was built along Whitehall. However, the government and the architect, Edwin Lutyens, favoured the original location and they eventually won the argument. Building of the permanent cenotaph began in May 1920. George V unveiled the new cenotaph on November the 11th, 1920. There were a few changes to the design, but none significant from the temporary one a year before. The laurel wreaths, real, on the temporary cenotaph were turned into carved stone wreaths on the new one, and the dates of the First World War were added with the words, the glorious dead. Subtle curvature, called entasis, was added to the sides and the tops so that they tapered inwards. This curve is too slight for the naked eye, but according to the architect, it was done to create a classical style akin to the Parthenon in Athens. By adding a cornice lid to the coffin of, on the top of the cenotaph, a shadow was cast over it, a deliberate feature of the work. The structure, therefore, seems very simple, but in many ways is actually quite complex. It was made entirely of Portland stone brought from Dorset. Lutyens had wanted to replace the silk flags which adorn the temporary cenotaph with stone painted ones, but this was rejected by the cabinet. And upon the unveiling, flags of the UK could be seen protruding from the two sides of the cenotaph. On the one side, the Union flag is flanked by the white ensign symbolizing the Royal Navy, and on the other side, a red ensign symbolizing the British Merchant Navy or passenger shipping, and on the other side, it was exactly the same, except a blue ensign, thought to symbolise the British overseas territories, replaced the red. Since 1943, the RAF ensign has replaced the white ensign on one side of the monument. Because the architects waived their fee entirely, the cost of the cenotaph was £7,325. Today, it would be about 296,400. It measures 35 feet or 11 meters tall and weighs about 120 tons. Importantly, the unveiling of the cenotaph was done as part of a much larger ceremony, which brought an unknown warrior from Flanders Fields to rest in Westminster Abbey. The procession passed the cenotaph and King George V laid a wreath on the unknown warrior's gun carriage. Elgar's hymn, The Spirit of England, was sung by all present, and then the service continued to Westminster Abbey, where the warrior was laid to rest. The public response to the new cenotaph was greater than even the year before. Whitehall was closed for several days as flowers piled up at the cenotaph's base. Within a week, 10 feet of flowers covered the entire area around the monument. In the years following the cenotaph's completion, a lot of artwork was inspired associated with it, such as the three paintings you can see here, but also a lot of poetry as well, including Siegfried Sassoon's At the Cenotaph from 1933. On the 8th of June 1946, the cenotaph was unveiled for a second time. This was part of Britain's formal victory celebrations that took place at the end of the Second World War. The dates of World War II were added to the monument and Princess Elizabeth added a wreath to the cenotaph as well. This is something that she would continue to do as queen for the next 70 years until her son took over responsibility in 2017.
As well as Remembrance Sunday, the Sunday closest to November the 11th, where the nation pays its respects to those who have fallen in conflicts since the First World War, the Cenotaph has a special association with a few other services too. On Armistice Day itself, the 11th of November at 11 a.m., a two-minute silence is held. This tradition has been reinvigorated in recent years by the Western Front Association, a charity dedicated to the memory of those who fell in the First World War. The first ceremony took place on the 11th of November 1919, with George V suggesting a two-minute silence. Thousands gathered and Prime Minister David Lloyd George walked from Downing Street to Leia Rees. A French representative of the President did so as well. The Royal Tank Regiment gathers at the Cenotaph on the Sunday after Remembrance Sunday, as this is generally the closest Sunday to the Battle of Cambrai, a bloody battle the regiment fought in from 1917, in which over 80,000 soldiers fell. Anzac Day, the 25th of April, sees a ceremony with the laying of the wreaths and a parade at 11am before a service is held at Westminster Abbey to commemorate the deaths of soldiers from Australia and New Zealand. The War Widows Association has an annual service on the Sunday before Remembrance Sunday. And since 1934, the Cenotaph has hosted the Belgium Parade on the Sunday before the Belgian National Day, July the 21st. This symbolised the close relationship between the UK and Belgium, formed during the First World War. In fact, many British soldiers met and married local Flemish women. Indeed, many settled in and around Ypres after the war, and English schools were even set up to cater for their children. Belgium are the only nation allowed to march uniform armed troops through central London. Well, that's all I've got. I hope it's been informative and that you've learned a bit. Thank you for watching and please remember them. Mademoiselle from Armitage, parlez-vous. Mademoiselle from Armitage, parlez-vous. Mademoiselle from Armitage, she hasn't been kissed in 40 years. Inky dinky, parlez-vous. Mademoiselle from Armitage, parlez-vous. Mademoiselle from Armitage, parlez-vous. Our topic in arm and tears broke the spell of 40 years. Zinky dinky, parlez-vous. Mademoiselle from arm and tears, parlez-vous. Mademoiselle from arm and tears, parlez-vous. You didn't have to know her long to know the reason men go wrong. Zinky dinky, parlez-vous. Mademoiselle from arm and tears, parlez-vous. Mademoiselle from Armitage, parlez-vous. She's hard as working dirty town. She makes her living upside down. Inky, inky, parlez-vous. Mademoiselle from Armitage, parlez-vous. Mademoiselle from Armitage, parlez-vous. She sold her kisses for ten francs each. Soft and juicy and sweet as a bee.
Inky, 